So welcome everyone to this new edition of the Seljukit lecture series. I'm Altai Joshkun from the University of Waterloo, Ontario. And I'm co-hosting this series together with my friend and colleague, Dr. Rabbi Ben Skolnik from Southern Connecticut State University. Uh, today we are having uh, or looking forward to a lecture that takes us right back to the very beginning of Seljukit history, and it will be presented to us by Angus Luelin Jacobson uh, from the University of Tasmania. He's a PhD student writing on the early relations of the Seljukids and the Antigonids. And it's quite funny, um, when I heard about his topic and was trying to find um, a suitable respondent, the first person I thought of was Charlotte Dunn, whom I've never met in person, but she is the co-author of the important Demetrius biography. And I knew that the other co-author, her former supervisor, Ped Wheatley, is retired, um, and I didn't don't have his details. So, but it turned out that um, that Charlotte is actually the supervisor of Angus, which makes him the third generation if we go as far back, but if we extend our perspective, then his great grandfather in academic terms is no one other than Adrian Brian Bosworth. Yeah. And that really reminds us um, of how important the contributions from down under, especially on the Hellenistic, the early Hellenistic period were. And we can connect it even a little bit further uh, to the area that I work in, because I do know that there was and perhaps still is a close relation between Pet um, and Waldemar Hedke uh, from the University of, um, of Calgary. Uh, and uh, Waldemar um, is, well, I don't have to introduce uh, his name to him. Whoever works on Alexander uh, is closely familiar with uh, um, Bosworth's uh, and uh, Heckel's work. But then it so happens that Waldemar is the former student of John Yardley, who lives actually nearby what uh, he lives in Milton which is less than an hour's drive from Waterloo so I've enjoyed in the time that I've been here in uh in Waterloo for 15 years now a couple of guest lectures by John uh, Yardley by Waldemar Heckel and also by Pat Wheatley and they are kind of one group and in a certain way you are then the fifth generation of scholars very renowned focusing on the early Hellenistic period. And as we see, as we shall see, there's always something new to discover uh, and uh, new to explore. So our expectations are very high, Angus. Before I give the floor to you, I just want to uh, uh, mention that we're very pleased that uh, Professor Catherine Salou from Paris is with us to provide expert feedback. Uh, and she will be presented uh, in some more detail after your presentation, Angus, by Ben. So the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you so much, Altai. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Um, that was a, a very lovely introduction, and I think um, highlights the the sort of uh, academic direction that I'm I'm trying to go in, and and the the names that I'm trying to live up to here as well. Um, importantly, thank you all for joining. Uh, it's it's a great honor to be here today to discuss, um, well, to, to present this paper, which is based on um, my first uh, chapter of uh, my PhD thesis, uh, which, as Altai said, uh, focuses on the uh, relationship between the Seleucids and the Antigonids, this so-called uh, oike oikeates, uh, or a kinship. Uh, as it's called in the epigraphic evidence. Um, and this, this is really going all the way back um, to the beginning. Um, but as I'm, I'm sure most people here are familiar with, um, sometimes when we're looking at such specialized topics uh, or even just the Hellenistic period in general, and especially the Seleucids, um, there is a, a battle to, to locate uh, even tiny shreds of information in very obscure sources. Um, that can uh, uh, support um, our arguments or, or shed new light on the Hellenistic world. Uh, luckily for us, uh, Libanius isn't that obscure. Uh, Libanius is, of course, uh, a fourth century CE uh, uh, orator uh, from Antioch. 
uh, the city which uh, Seleucus created that will be or founded that will be important later uh, but Antioch uh, so Elabanius is a um, a prolific writer he is responsible for over 1500 uh, uh, orations declamaciones uh, epistles uh, which is a huge number and I think maybe more than Cicero as well um, but uh, for those not really uh, familiar with with late antiquity um, it's not a name that you'd see often or a source that you'd think or, or his sources are, are not something that you'd think to use often either. Uh, but he was, of course, also uh, uh, the confidant of uh, the Emperor Julian II, uh, better known as the Apostate, um, which is uh, perhaps why he's so um, well, well renowned, or at least he's been popularized in, in, in today's uh, <clears throat> today's scholarship. So without further ado, um, I'd like to show you the, the passage that I'll be focusing on today, um, which is from the Antiochus, uh, or the 11th oration uh, of Libanius. Uh, and essentially in this, um, in this oration, Libanius uh, recounts the, the events that led to Antioch's foundation. Uh, and in it, he also discusses uh, Seleucus's flight uh, from um, Babylon, which is, of course, the, the focus of today. Uh, we're looking at flight traditions or Seleucid flight traditions more specifically. And this is what Libanius has to say. Uh, so after the war with uh, Eumenes, uh, he notes that uh, Antigonus turned on Seleucus, um, who had uh, been raised to eminence through him, uh, which is a bit of a stretch, I have to say. Uh, but he then notes, uh, then, as if in a play, some god stretched his protecting hand over him, uh, being Seleucus, uh, for from the same family arose plots for his death and the means of his salvation. Just as Ariadne, in admiration of handsome Theseus, brought the youth safe from the labyrinth with her length of cord, so Demetrius, son of Antigonus, in admiration of Seleucus's noble qualities, advised him of his father's treachery by means of a message which he wrote in the dust with the butt of his spear, and unnoticed by the others present, informed him of what was impending. A fascinating passage, uh, and if authentic, uh, or at least resultant of early Antigonid Seleucid propaganda, then Libanius preserves a tradition which transforms the initial uh, Seleucid Antigonid or Caetes from an alliance formed only on uh, necessity and, and shared distrust. This is the alliance at Rossus in 300. Uh, for the other successors, uh, to one established on prior camaraderie, uh, cementing the origins of their dynasty's cooperation even before its conception. So in order to uh, untangle uh, both the, uh, the, historic the historicity of this uh, tradition and also um, whether it can actually shed light on this relationship between Seleucus and Demetrius, uh, we're going to do uh, three things in particular. Um, the first thing I'm going to, to go through uh, is a comparison of Libanius's uh, flight myth or flight tradition, really, the Demetrius Soter tradition, as I call it and will call it from now on, um, comparing this with the other Seleucid flight myth traditions. And this is really just to um, see if Libanius is, is being faithful to uh, the established tradition surrounding Seleucus's flight from Babylon to Egypt. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, it is also necessary to um, compare the this uh, Demetrius Soter tradition uh, with another uh, tradition, a strikingly similar story uh, about Mithridates Catistes' uh, flight uh, from the Antigonids, which also features Demetrius as a savior. And it's important here to understand, uh, to determine that the origin, purpose, and veracity of each of these uh, traditions, um, because of course, uh, uh, considering how similar they are, one must or, or, or likely was uh, building upon uh, the other. Um, so I, I hope to shed a little bit more light on that um, today. And uh, uh, finally, uh, as I'm sure um, Catherine can appreciate, um, I'm also going to be uh, understanding the Demetrius Soter tradition in Libanius's own contexts, um, trying to understand whether 
or, or, or if this um, tradition was authentic, then why Libanius, um, of all people, decided to include it uh, when so many other sources, such as Plutarch and, and Diodorus Siculus, um, decided not to include it, uh, which is which is equally as important as understanding it in the Hellenistic context. So Libanius's decision to relate Seleucus's flight and following exploits uh, derives from the object of his oration's praise. Uh, the city Antioch, uh, which uh, Seleucus, of course, uh, constructed around uh, April or May 300, uh, is the dates that uh, John Malalas gives to us. Uh, the, the oration was delivered at the 356 uh, Antiochian uh, Olympics uh, and probably should have uh, conformed with Olympic speech conventions, uh, which while pra praising the city, uh, mostly sought to uh, celebrate the games. Um, Libanius's Antiochus did not do this, however. Uh, it is uh, almost... Uh, solely um, city praise, uh, so it has a very strong focus on on praising the city rather than the Olympics Olympic Games. Uh, and as Catherine uh, states um, in one of her articles on on this um, fascinating text, um, the primary aim is hardly to eulogize the concluded competition. Uh, but to present the city, uh, in quotation marks, as conforming to a model of the ideal city, and in fact, as being the ideal city. So in this, uh, in understanding this being um, uh, Libanius's uh, motive, uh, it is perhaps understandable and expected uh, that he glorifies the city's founder, Seleucus. Uh, for Libanius, Antioch's greatness is contingent on Seleucus's pre, uh, equal preeminence, uh, prompting the orator to distort historical events, uh, to fashion his Seleucus as a paragon of virtue and the one true heir to both Alexander and the Heraclidae who had, in, uh, who, who had inhabited the land uh, before. Uh, as some examples of this uh, historical distortion, um, he uh, removes Antipater's uh, authority in in granting um, uh, granting Seleucus the satrapy of of Babylon, uh, and and uh, uses or, or really it makes it seem as though uh, it is the Macedonians, the people, uh, who grant this position to Seleucus. Uh, so he's being chosen by the people. So Antipater is completely uh, removed from Triparadesus uh, in three twenty and. Uh, there are also uh, there is also no inclusion of the um, accusations surrounding Seleucus's role in Perdiccas's death. <laughs> but despite his innate uh, inclination to aggrandize Seleucus, uh, Libanius's version of Seleucus's flight from uh, Babylon to Egypt, excluding Demetrius's involvement. Uh, essentially follows the same tradition as uh, that in Diodorus, Appian, and Pausanias. All four literary versions relate that the event transpired in Babylon during Antigonus's inspection of the eastern satrapies and depict Monophthalmus and Seleucus as uh, antagonist and protagonist, respectively. Why exactly relations soured between Antigonus and Seleucus uh, during his Babylonian visit is best eliminated by Diodorus and Appian, who state that Antigonus requested an account of revenue, uh, albeit that there, there are different reasons uh, for this in the sources. Still, Libanius's statement that Antigonus developed a phthonos or a grudge out of fear for Seleucus's increasing power is hardly awry. Uh, Diodorus implies a similar reasoning behind Antigonus's mistreatment of uh, Seleucus, relating that Monophthalmus employed the revenue accounting request as a pretext to eliminate the Babylonian satrap, uh, who was capable of claiming, uh, in his words, a share in the government, uh, and, and probably also as a, uh, a result of his, um, his, his capable governance uh, in his early years as Babylonian satrap. Uh, only Appian provides Seleucus's insubordination and punishment of Antigonus's uh, subordinate officer 
as justification for the increasing hostility between these two uh, individuals, uh, marking Antigonus's actions as unpremeditated. Now, in contrast to Brodison's uh, belief that the discrepancies between Diodorus and Appian's reasoning suggest, uh, sorry, suggest, uh, sorry, uh, because, <laughs> In contrast to Brodison's belief that discrepancies between Diodorus and Appian's account uh, result from the lat latter's brevity, uh, the consistency of Labanius and Diodorus's uh, reasoning suggests that Mel was correct in assuming that Appian is here drawing from a different source, more favorable towards the Antigonids. Still, all four authors agree on Ptolemy's role as the ultimate savior in the story, uh, providing the fugitive Seleucus asylum and eventually military assistance. Uh, I should also note that, that Pausanias' uh, chronology here is uh, markedly confused uh, due to its brevity. Uh, he, he imparts that Seleucus essentially um, returned to Babylon uh, not soon after his, his flight and um, put to death Antigonus in Babylon, uh, and also captured Babylon, uh, Demetrius in Babylon as well. Uh, so he is um, condensing some 30 years here, uh, which, which is um, <laughs> not very good in, in our interests. Still, while the legend of Seleucus's flight itself uh, is part of a longstanding tradition of horseback flight myths, uh, as Ogden uh, has demonstrated in his legend of Seleucus, uh, the historicity of Seleucus's escape from Antigonus to Ptolemy is certain, uh, given the consistent dating and the evidence from the Babylonian cuneiform tablet BM35920, as I have listed down in the table below. Uh, Labanius, Diodorus, and Appian all date the flight to late 316 or early 315, uh, which coincides with Antigonus's visit to Babylon. In Appian and Labanius, Antigonus's defeat of Eumenes after Gabienne in early 316 secures the terminus postquem of late 316. Diodorus, however, not only introduces the year of this event as 316, but provides the Roman consuls Naltius Spurius and Marcus Poplius, uh, and also supplies um, the flight's definitive terminus antiquem of November. 316 by dating Antigonus's arrival in Cilicia after the setting of Orion. Such dating significantly coincides with the incomplete uh, BM35920, which positions Seleucus's flight from Antigonus in year one of an unsure ruler. Now, as this year is marked as the eighth and final year of Philip III's reign, overlapping with Alexander IV's first in the Diadochi Chronicle, uh, the uncertain ruler is more likely uh, to be Alexander uh, than Antigonus, uh, and the flight should thus be dated to 316 or 315, or that year in general, uh, rather than the, the suspect dating of Antigonus's rule to 317, 316. The overall similarities, as I've catalogued here, uh, especially between Labanius and Diodorus, demonstrate that the orator was evidently well acquainted with the legends concerning Seleucus's flight and likely drawing on Diodorus or Diodorus's sources. Despite his account's otherwise faithful nature, the other sources exclusion of Demetrius as a savior suggests that this is an invention and does not originate in a contemporary source. Plutarch and John Malalas, however, lend credibility uh, to a contemporary Demetrius Socha tradition. Although Malalas writes later than Labanius, it's important to note that his description of a horse and a helmet statue bearing the inscription on this Seleucus fled from Antigonus and was saved. Uh, he returned there and conquered and killed him ultimately draws from Pausanias of Antioch, uh, who was a uh, likely a first century um, uh, Ctistes writer, so a, a foundation writer uh, who wrote the foundation of um, Antioch. Now, the statue significantly demonstrates that the flight legend was important enough to Seleucid ideology uh, 
that Seleucus erected a statue, uh, but also because no specific saviour is named. Um, the anonymity of Seleucus's saviour in this statue allows for the possibility uh, that Ptolemy or Demetrius, or in fact both, uh, assume the role of saviour in a, another contemporary tradition. What remains clear, however, from this brief overview of the sources is that the Antiochus and the main sources agree that Seleucus fled uh, from Babylon in mid-16 uh, and that the consequent myth which emerged from the flight bore substantial soterial connotations, regardless of whether Demetrius was historically responsible for Seleucus's salvation. Now the fun bit. Um, <laughs> There exists another legendary flight myth uh, fr from the Antigonids, uh, directly involving the Antigonids, uh, which serves as the Mithridates uh, foundational myth and complicates the historicity of Libanius's version. The story of Mithridates the first Catistes escaped from Antigonus's jealousy, found early in Plutarch's Demetrius and also in his Moralia, essentially follows the same narrative as Demetrius. Both versions could be dated to Antigonus's inspection of the eastern satrapies, and just as uh, Libanius's Demetrius saved Seleucus from Antigonus's Thonos by silently warning the satrap with a message on the ground, so too does Plutarch's Demetrius write the command Fuge Mithridata uh, to warn his companion of his father's impending treachery. The only major difference is, of course, uh, the recipient of Demetrius's uh, friendship. Plutarch himself employs the story to emphasize Demetrius's early philanthropia uh, before he supposedly uh, devolved into depravity, uh, which is perhaps an explanation for why he places it so early on uh, in this, uh, in this um, biography and, and also in this chronology as well, uh, but more on that soon. Uh, at first glance, um, the Seleucid version's likelihood uh, far outweighs that of the Mithridatic one, especially considering Antigonus's jealousy toward Mithridates supposedly festered due to a dream of the prince's uh, future fortunes. However, this is likely just a, a literary device in general. Uh, only Appian otherwise records Mithridates' flight, um, albeit without Demetrius and much later. Uh, Wheatley, uh, as my academic grandfather, as as Altai says, <laughs> argues that Appian and Plutarch's versions uh, secure both the Mithridatic flight's historicity and date, uh, placing it in 314 on account of the story's early position uh, in the Demetrius, and because Demetrius and Antigonus no longer campaigned together after this year. Uh, I believe he also places it entire uh, because of the mention of um, of the beach uh, that, that Mithridates and Demetrius are walking on. Um, this may be had Demetrius truly intervened to save Mithridates. Uh, as Altai astutely highlights in his recent amendations um, of the Mithridatic um, uh, chronology or the, or the, the early uh, chronology of Mithridates' Catistes' reign, uh, several factors, including the rebellion of Mithridates' father in circa 302, and Antigonus's uh, apparent indifference towards the prince and his family, whose wealth had supposedly threatened him so greatly for the following 12 years, uh, indicate the invented nature of Plutarch's version, and also that Mithridates' flight must have occurred after Antigonus executed his family, uh, father. In fact, Appian's account actually supports the dating of Mithridates' flight uh, from the Antigonids to 302, and thus Demetrius's non-involvement, in that he later attributes the Pontic Kingdom's foundation to Catistes' revolt, uh, apost apostanthos, uh, which is funnily enough where we get the word apostate, um, rather than his uh, fugue, his flight. Uh, so essentially here what I'm trying to say is that in the first part of Appian's, um, the first mention of Mithridates in Appian's Mithridatic Wars, uh, he says that um, essentially Mithridates 
fled from uh, Antigonus due to Antigonus's grudge against him. Uh, however, in the last part, he reports this as a revolt rather than uh, a flight. Um, so uh, the former more closely resembles Diodorus's account, wherein Mithridates' uh, family revolts against Antigonus in favour of Cassander uh, during, during Cassander's pre-Ipsus preparations in 302 resulting in his father's death, that is Mithridates' father's death, uh, and likely Monophthalmus's practical pursuit of the entire family, uh, which would plausibly uh, drive Catistes in to establish a kingdom elsewhere, like uh, Aphlagonia, according to Strabo. Mithridates', Mithridates flight, then, is a result of his father's treachery and not Antigonus's, and is better positioned in 302 without Demetrius, the intervention of whom must have been added post-eventum. That Hieronymus is responsible for the Mithridatic flight myths, uh, flight tradition circulation, including Demetrius Sota, uh, is suspect. Uh, Hieronymus might have personally interacted with Mithr Mithridates and written on the Pontic Kingdom's rise, but it is evident from the traditions or the certain fragments in Appian and Pseudo-Lucian and less certain fragment in Diodorus that Demetrius was not involved in Hieronymus's version. What seems more likely, as the Italian scholar Primo has already asserted, uh, is that the Plutarch's account is drawing on a Pontic tradition uh, which distorts Hieronymus's account by conflating it with the Seleucid flight myth, which might have involved Demetrius at some point to enhance the Mithridatic dynasty's legitimacy. Primo significantly emphasizes that the compatibility of Diodorus and Labanius's accounts, which I've already highlighted in, in the catalog above, uh, and the lack of agreement between Appian and Plutarch's Mithridatic versions strongly favors Seleucus as the original recipient of uh, Demetrius's salvation. Understanding the Demetrius social tradition as a Seleucid invention consequently raises the issue of dating its creation. As earlier advocates of the argument that Primo more comprehensively proposed, uh, Futurus and Krishka uh, suggested in their Antiochicus commentary that the tradition derives from Euphorion of Calchas, who had served as uh, Antioch's librarian under Antiochus III, uh, and whose works Labanius used in this oration. So we actually do know that, that Labanius was uh, making use of Euphorion in uh, the Antiochicus. On the other hand, uh, Weimar uh, situated the story's creation to the 290s to 280s, which is quite a broad range. Um, but during which Demetrius and Seleucus were drawing on uh, one another's legitimacy, which is a, a focus of my thesis. Um, but all arguments neglect one crucial element in the story, which deteriorates their probability, uh, that being the presence of, um, of course, Ptolemy I as uh, the ultimate saviour. While Antiochus III's ordering of Demetrius' inclusion as Sota in Seleucus's flight tradition is plausible, given his good relations with the Antigonid king Philip V, his decision to promote his nemesis, the Ptolemies, uh, by glorifying its founder is unlikely. Moreover, the period which Weimar, Weimar proposes uh, seldom witnesses moments when all three successes are in synergy. I propose that only after the marriage between Seleucus and Stratonici and during the former's mediation of Demetrius's proposed marriage to Ptolemaeus, Ptolemy's daughter, uh, do we find a period where all three dynasts were actively cooperating for each other's benefits. Given this small window of friendliness, the tradition's creation, which equally glorifies Seleucus, Demetrius, and Ptolemy, must have occurred sometime between uh, 300 and 297. Uh, the original dates that I had there were 298 and 296, but I've since um, changed that because I, I do date the the, the uh, conference at Rosses to 300, uh, mid 300. And um, of course, in 296, Demetrius uh, had already um, deteriorated his his relationship with Ptolemy by attacking Athens. 
so I believe that the, the, the period between 300 and 297 is probably more likely uh, for this triad, as I call it. But this significantly challenges the belief that the activities of Seleucus and Demetrius's uh, Oikeates uh, were solely confined to the conference at Rossus, Nicagoras's embassy to uh, Ephesus, and Seleucus's mediation of Demetrius's marriage to Ptolemaeus. Here exists an example of not two successes, but three actively cooperating to develop a tradition which enhances the dynastic legitimacy of all involved. Following the legend's circulation, Mithridates likely seized the opportunity to enhance his own legitimacy by circulating his version of Seleucus's flight, replacing the satrap with Demetrius's uh, and Demetrius's companion, pardon, with himself. Mithridates had, after all, uh, been Demetrius's friend before he revolted from the Macedonians, and by erasing Seleucus from the legend, he could effectively damage the influence and reputation of the adversary that threatened his dynastic ambitions. But if we accept, therefore, that the Mithridatic flight myth uh, emerged during Catistes' conflict with the Seleucids and consequent assumption of kingship traditionally dated to 281. This is, of course, uh, alluded to in Memnon's uh, fragments. Um, <clears throat> then, uh, then there would be little value in propagandizing the Demetrius Sota tradition uh, if we retained the 281 date, uh, given the besieger had now perished. Um, and, and of course, Antigonus had inherited uh, his kingdom. Yet, if we follow uh, Altai's recent amendments to the Pontic Kingdom's chronology, dating Mithridates' reign to 283, Catistes' adoption of the legend becomes understandable. By arresting Demetrius in, in around 285 and imprisoning him to the point of death, Pausanias imparts that Seleucus's name was great among all men. Uh, although the verb that he uses here suggests a positive reaction, uh, Seleucus's mistreatment of such an admired leader, uh, not to mention his ex-father-in-law, uh, must have caused some resentment among Macedonians. And indeed, um, a fragment of Diodorus, I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, but a fragment of Diodorus's, um, uh, his, his Bibliotheca also um, notes that uh, after the death of uh, Demetrius, uh, Seleucus was shamed for his mistreatment of his ex-father-in-law. Um, in circulating the legend, in fact, that, that Mithridates was the true friend of Demetrius, uh, or, or the true friend whom Demetrius had saved, uh, Mithridates' appeal uh, to those still loyal to Demetrius must have been effective. He had appeared in Demetrius's final moments as his oldest friend, seeking to avenge the wrongs that Seleucus had committed against him. But while Mithridates' variation uh, or variation and adaption of an earlier Seleucid myth, uh, Demetrius, to Seleucid Demetrius Sota tradition, rather, uh, now seems likely, uh, the historicity of Demetrius' salvation of Seleucus is no clearer. Libanius' interjection that the event occurred as if in a play uh, does not give us much hope, really. Uh, it really suggests that he himself uh, reckoned the story uh, fictional. Um, but this, in a way, also um, reinforces that the orator was here drawing upon an established tradition, if he is able to make that um, comment on this story. But the existence of, of a friendship or, or a relationship between Seleucus and Demetrius, founded on admiration, is certainly plausible. Seleucus had not personally participated in Antigonus's final campaign against Eumenes, despite still contributing troops, but Demetrius would undoubtedly have appreciated other noble qualities uh, which contributed to Seleucus's repute. Unlike Demetrius, born too late to participate in Alexander's campaigns, Seleucus had been elevated to one of Alexander's closest companions for his valour, marking him as an intimate contemporary of the late king. Uh, and with the king, uh, Alexander being Demetrius's uh, famed hero, uh, it, is, it is fair enough to say, I think, that Demetrius would not have refused to 
uh, refused the opportunity to, to fraternize with such an individual. And what is more, although the sources uh, depict hostilities between Seleucus and Antigonus intensifying soon after the latter's arrival, uh, the chronology of Antigonus's departure from Susa at the conclusion of winter in 316 uh, February, uh, arrival in Babylonia uh, 22 days later, and then arrival in Marlus Cilicia in November 316, allows actually for a substantial period in which Seleucus and Demetrius could have developed uh, a friendship. Given that the distance from Babylon to the Pyramus River in Cilicia is approximately twice the distance from Susa to Babylon, it must have taken uh, two months to complete this trip. This pinpoints Antigonus's departure from Babylon to around September 316, indicating that Antigonus resided with Seleucus at Babylon before driving him out and reorganizing the satrap from March to July at least. So a three month period, uh, which is quite, quite a lengthy amount of time. More importantly, it is worth, worthwhile stressing how closely Plutarch's account of the Rossus Conference uh, and Demetrius's later arrest in 285 mirrors the Seleucid flight tradition in Labanius. For example, the dynasts' immediate camaraderie at Rossus, exemplified that by their public enjoyment of each other's company for days, all without guards and arms, as Plutarch says, echoes Demetrius's own relationship with his father, which was admired for its cordiality. Uh, indicating that this friendship's roots were far deeper than Plutarch reveals. Uh, so essentially, um, Plutarch, so, so essentially, sorry, um, Antigonus and Demetrius had this um, sort of unshakable relationship, and really all of the Antigonids do as well. It's something that the dynasty is quite famous for, uh, is that they um, have this strong familial bonds. Uh, and in many ways, the relationship between Seleucus and Demetrius at Rossus, who had just been at war a year before, uh, is quite unusual um, because of its similarity to this close relationship. Now, upon hearing that Demetrius had finally surrendered to his ex-son-in-law in Syria, Seleucus also remarked that it was not the good fortune of Demetrius that brought him safety, but his, being Seleucus, uh, his own. Detached from the Demetrius Soter tradition, Seleucus's Tuki here is uh, ambiguous. Had Demetrius, however, truly saved Seleucus, then the statement has profound connotations. It was not Demetrius's ostensibly good luck or consistent luck, which had once more saved him, but Seleucus's fortune that Demetrius had thwarted his demise so many years ago. Without this salvation, Demetrius's fortunes would not have been reversed at Rossus after Ipsus, and then again in Syria. Such strong allusions to Demetrius's earlier rescue of Seleucus uh, suggests to me at least that, that Plutarch had been aware of this tradition, understood its significance to the overall narrative of Seleucus and Demetrius's complex relationship, but elected to replace it with the Mithridatic tradition, which re he removes from its original context and awkwardly makes concurrent with Seleucus's flight. But we surely cannot believe that Labanius included this legend uh, for the sole purpose of, of altruistically uh, preserving overlooked history. The orator must have had ulterior motives in glorifying Demetrius Polyokertes. Considering that the Antiochus del Antiochus's delivery coincides with Julian II's elevation to Caesar, we might naturally uh, we might naturally seek out comparisons of Julian and Seleucus, or more unusually, um, Demetrius as well. Such an approach, however, uh, is fruitless. Although some have asserted that the Antiochus doubles as a celebration of the polytheistic cult's return. Labanius and Julian had not yet developed the rapport that impelled the former to idolize the latter. And even then, Labanius would recognize Alexander as Julian's equal, not Seleucus or Demetrius. Uh, and in fact, Julian would not even view Alexander as his equal. He would view Marcus Aurelius as his equal. But it is Alexander that um, Labanius chooses later on in his funeral oration for Julian. 
to to para, to to mirror um, Julian's achievements. Who or what Labanius was promoting through the inclusion of this Seleucid flight tradition is perhaps multifaceted. Explicitly, Labanius's use of Thesaeus and Ariadne to anal uh, analogize, pardon, Seleucus and Demetrius's relationship suggests not romantic implications, uh, but an attempt to link Seleucus and Thes Thesaeus and the cities they founded, Antioch and Athens. Here, Labanius desires to cement Antioch as, a, uh, as one of the two major intellectual hubs of the Roman world. And just as Ariadne betrayed her father by providing uh, Thesaeus with a nonverbal means of escaping the labyrinth, the thread, Labanius required a story re uh, relating to Seleucus's origins, uh, which featured the antagonist's helpful offspring to cement Seleucus and Thesaeus's connection. It just so happened that Demetrius already fit Ariadne's role in an existing tradition. Uh, and I would add as a quote, uh, as a as a note as well that that this is um not the only time that uh, Seleucus is compared with um, uh, with Thesaeus. Of course, we also have um, the example of the Hippolytus uh, or, or the, the argument that um, the Antiochus Stratonici tradition, um, the, the love story surrounding Antiochus and Stratonici is actually based on Euripides' uh, Hippolytus or the story of Hippolytus. Um, and in this, uh, it is also comparing uh, Seleucus to um, Thesaeus. So there might be something deeper there that, that Lubanius knew about and we, we just don't know about today. Um, but more implicitly, uh, the, the, the Demetrius Soda tradition's inclusion could reflect an attempt to enhance uh, the reputation of Lubanius' uh, polytheist companion, a senator also named Demetrius. Uh, in Platonic thought, uh, most it clearly demonstrated in the Cratylus. Uh, names were powerful educative tools which assisted in understanding the nature of things. Um, similarly, and perhaps more importantly, uh, the Neoplatonist Iamblichus, whom Libanius, like Julian, revered, uh, states in his De Mysterias uh, that names were dependent on the nature of real beings. Uh, suggesting that those with the same names essentially retain similar natures. To a Neoplatonist, Demetrius's name could negatively could have negatively influenced uh, homonymous uh, individuals' reputation, insinuating to others that they were innately depraved as the besieger was so often perceived. In this case, Labanius would be obliged to vindicate his friend's name by demonstrating Polyoketi's true philanthropic nature, particularly by emphasizing his indispensable role in Antioch's creation. Senator Demetrius's namesake would no longer be a depraved despot, but a vital contributor to Antioch's foundation. Given that Labanius also sent the Antiochicus to his friend Demetrius, he evidently expected that his recipient would be personally interested in the oration. Libanius likely chose to include the Demetrius Soda tradition then because it proved consistent with his Theseus and Ariadne analogy and because, in a way, it elevated his friend's name. So by comparing various Seleucid flights, and especially the Demetrius Soda traditions found in Plutarch and Libanius, it becomes evident not only that the orator's account generally adheres to an established tradition uh, or an established legend, but also that the Mithridatic tradition uh, adapted an earlier Seleucid tradition, uh, which sought to promote both Seleucid Antigonid, uh, both the Seleucid Antigonid alliance and the triadic friendship of the successors. The comparisons alongside understanding the context of Antigonus's visit to Babylonia in 316 also lend considerably, uh, considerable credibility to the Demetrius Soter tradition, implying to some extent that the future in ki uh, kings had bonded before fate set them against one another. Considering Labanius's contemporary contexts too, the orator likely preserved the tradition uh, because, as I've just said, uh, of the suitability for his Theseus and Ariadne analogy, which linked Athens and Antioch, and to redeem his friend's reputation by exonerating his namesake. Whether the besieger truly saved the victorious uh, may forever remain circumstantial. 
but the Demetrius social tradition powerfully demonstrates that Sir Lucas and Demetrius perceived value in promoting the long-standing nature of their oikeates, mythologizing Sir Lucas's flight and Demetrius's involvement as a moment crucial to each dynasty's persistence. It is only Libanius, some seven centuries later, who perceives its significance to the Seleucid narrative. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Angus. That was great. Um, and by the way, congratulations! Not only did you keep yourself up, you kept us up. You kept us up <laughs> with that wonderful. That's good life. to hear. <laughs> okay. Um, what is it? Two o'clock now for you? Something. Yeah, uh, almost. So, as our expert respondent, we're calling. We're very happy to be calling on Katrine Salou. Uh, she has written extensively on the law of neighborhood and construction in the Roman world, and on Antioch and Syria and Gaza in late antiquity. Professor of Roman history at the University of Paris H. She began a research program on the topography of ancient and medieval Antioch in 2010. That's still going on. And since 2013, she's been a, a cumulative director of studies at the Ecole Pratique. And she wrote on Libanius, very relevant for today. Libanius is uh, uh, Antioch Antiochus, uh, Mirror of a, a City, Antioch in 356, in a book called The Many Faces of Antioch. So we welcome Katrine to our series. And Angus, if you could stop sharing, you already did. And we're going to share uh, Katrine's um, right now. Um, can you can you see that? Um, hold on. Um, can you can you see this? Yes, somebody. I yeah. can now. Yeah. OK, OK. Okay, Katrine. Uh, Katrine, I think you're muted. So, yeah, good. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, thank you very much for this um, introduction. And uh, so I prepared some written slides because my English, my accent English, is not so good. Uh, so, can you hear me and see me? Because uh, I, I did. Well, okay. Um, very well. Very well. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much to Angus. Uh, um, I am really very, very happy that you, uh, in a way, you you did uh, rehabilitations of uh, Libanius as a source, as a possible source for the Hellenistic history. Uh, and it's very really rare that um, um, that that the uh, that historian specialist for the uh, in the Hellenistic period read Libanius and uh, you are perfectly right to to read, to read and to try to use Libanius and I am very very happy so thank you thank you very much and I I found your demonstration uh, very convincing uh, so uh, I, I am. Yes, I think that you you are right, but uh, of course, um, regarding the uh, chronology of the very beginning of the Hellenistic period, uh, I am enfin, maybe um, the uh, other participant to this seminary uh, may have some criticism, but for my part, I found that your demonstration was a very um, very con convincing. Alors, the other slide, please. Um, because uh, I have uh, some comments, uh, I have some comments to do. Uh, can can I uh, um, please uh, the next slide, please? I'm I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying. Um, hold on one second. Let's try again. Oh, I can use my uh, own. You know, how about how about if how about if I make you? Um, sorry. Um, can you, can you see that? No, if, uh, if you... Okay, I'm making you co-host. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Sorry. No. Okay, uh, je continue, sorry. Okay. Uh, okay, now you should be able to do it. Yes, yes. Alors, now I must, je dois te retrouver ma... So it, it, it will come. So let me move. Voilà. Alors. Uh, 
Uh, okay. Can you see? Can you see? Can you see now yeah. my yes. my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, I have yeah. some some comments. Alors some very marginal comments or remarks um, regarding the relationship between Pausanias, Pausanias of Antioch, and Malalas. Uh, you should be more careful. In fact, nature and extent, so the lines of uh, quotations of uh, Posanias by Malalas, are very difficult to define. Uh, in fact, uh, we know well, it's very difficult. And um, uh, Posanias' datation is unclear. It may be dated from the fourth century or maybe from the, from the, of the second century. We don't know that. Uh, and um, in this case, uh, in this case of these quotations of um, Malalas, it is possible that the reference to Pausanias pertains only to the number of cities founded by Seleucus and to the name of the foundation. Um, to explain for the um, uh, other participants, um, Malalas is a chronographer of the sixth century and he writes an uh, universal history and in the book, in um, 16 books, and in the book uh, eight, uh, he, he relates, he relates the, the Hellenistic period, beginning with Alexander, and he relates the foundations of the four cities of the tetra, so-called Tetrapolis, uh, and it is a, a long uh, relation. Um, and at the very end, he explains that according to Pausanias, um, Seleucus, 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 Seleucus um, founded uh, 17, uh, 70 cities, according to Pausanias. It, it doesn't mean that all the tales of the foundations comes from Pausanias. Um, by the way, some, it, it may be interesting for you to know that some hints um, suggest that Pausanias, the great Pausanias, uh, Pausanias the Perieget, the Perigetes, uh, may have connections with Syria or with Antioch, and may be an Antiochian. Not the same as, as Pausanias of Antioch, of course, but the great Pausanias may be an Antiochian. Um, this, this hint at the fact that he refers several times to Daphne near Antioch or to the Orontes, uh, etc. Um, it may be interesting um, in order to uh, study the relationship uh, between uh, his version of uh, Seleucus flight and the other versions. And by the way, as a statue of a Seleucid king state of uh, the Seleucid king taming a bronze bull refers to Antiochus force and uh, no to uh, Sele Seleucus. Um, more um, uh, in the front, not so marginal, uh, not, of course you are perfectly right, the comparison between uh, Se Seleucus and Seleucus uh, is a way to compare uh, Antioch to Athens, and it is one of the goals of Libanius in the Antiochicus to uh, assimilate, to equal Antioch with Athens. Hassan. So it's perfectly, uh, you are perfectly right. There is also another reason which um, makes the comparison very um, logical and very good. Uh, Ariadne acts with her father like Demetrius with his father. It's, it's a very good comparison, very precise comparison. Uh, Alors, regarding the hypothesis of an allusion to uh, the friend, uh, friend of Libanios, whose name is Demetrios, and in the prosopography of the later Roman Empire is Demetrius II, um, I, I am not convic convinced. Uh, I think it's not, um, not convincing. Uh, a quick search in the uh, lexicon of Greek personal names uh, database. Uh, I, I searched Demetrios for century and I had uh, 347 results. So it's a very common name. 
And um, in the history too, there is a lot of Demetrius. There are two kings, uh, two uh, Seleucid kings, uh, whose name I are Demetrius too, and there is a lot of Demetrius. Um, I, I don't, it's difficult to, to prove, or you must prove, you must prove if you want to be um, convincing that the name Demetrius points particularly to this Demetrius, the, the uh, Antigonus, Antigonus son, or, uh, voilà, and you must also prove that Demetrius, this Demetrius, is really a uh, hill reput um, um, in the individual. It's not so. So I think that your hypothesis, this hypothesis, is a far-fetched hypothesis, far-fetched. I'm, I'm sorry for my accent, so bon, you are done. Uh, and I have also two questions or suggestions of further research. Um, and thank you that because um, I read a new, I read a fresh, I read a fresh uh, so a Libanius, Libanius text. Um, alors, first questions. Uh, Libanius um, compares the the story here uh, with a play uh, or with a theater play uh, by using the word the word drama uh, which means exactly uh, the actions in the theater the actions uh, alors, but this comparison this comparison may refer only to the fact that uh, uh, this story uh, the story that from the same family uh, plots for his death and means for his salvation which is very theatrical very dramatical or it's maybe it's referred to a drama a precise play involving Ariadne and Theseus and uh, second question the gesture the gesture gestures seems play a striking role in in Salerskin history. I think to the tales of the circle designed by Popilius Linus around Antiochus the Fourth. It's very fascinating. In fact, I have I am not specialist for Hellenistic history, so I I never worked on this story, but uh, I find I find this story fascinating. And it is also it is uh, another time a story of gesture and of uh, silent silent communication. Um, and more generally speaking, the gesture of tracing things on the ground is recurrent in literature. Uh, in Vitruvius, so Vitruvius uh, writes um, at the very beginning of the, of the Augustian period in Latin, but it is imbued uh, with Hellenistic culture. And um, in the preface of the book Sex, Aristippus, the philosopher, uh, was shipwrecked on the coast of Rhodes and observing geometrical diagrams drawn upon the sand, he is said to have shouted, I see human footsteps. Of course, it is not just statue, it is a result of the gesture, but it is the same uh, idea to write something, to write something um, in, the, in the ground. And uh, you know the evangel, John, Eight, uh, sex week, sex eight. It is uh, the story of the woman caught in adultery. Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And uh, a second time he wrote on the ground. Um, maybe it will be interesting for you to uh, to study uh, this uh, motif, this stemma. Do you do you understand? Uh, uh, with my bad English, um, uh, and in order to to better explain the um, genesis of this tale of this story, uh, and maybe look, I suggest you another uh, far-fetched hypothesis uh, because you like some far-fetched hypothesis. Um, so maybe um, there is an allusion to a pantomime. Alors, pantomime. Uh, uh, in um, mean, means dance, I think you you know that. But uh, and in the um, uh, Roman Empire and in the later antiquity, it is really the more important kind of um, of spectacle, of theater play. There is no more. Um, there is mime and there is pantomime. 
Um, and uh, voilà, I, I give you a, a little uh, bibliographical indication. And I add that the word drama may apply to a pantomime, really. Alors, Lucian, Lucianos, wrote a treaty uh, on the dance, and it was an um, a answer to uh, Aelius Aristide, Aelius Aristides, Aelius Aristides, I know, Aelius Aristides wrote against the dancers, against the dance, and Lucian wrote uh, for the dance, uh, in um, in defense of, of the dance, and after that, Libanius wrote also um, a, a speech for the dancers and for the dance. It's uh, the the and um, the dance is pantomime, uh, and so the pantomime is very important uh, in the life uh, of the people of the Roman Empire and of the later antiquity, and it is also very important for the uh, writer, for the sophists, and so for the intellectual. Um, alors, in his uh, De Saltatione uh, on dance, uh, Lucian gives um, a list of subjects of pantomimes, of possible subjects of pantomimes, and he, he gives, for instance, Ceseus and the labyrinth Ariadne. So it may be that there, um, there was really pantomimes um, with uh, showing uh, on the play in theater Ceseus and Ariadne. Alors, in fact, uh, I didn't find trace of pantomime with historical subjects, but maybe it is necessary to check that, but I didn't find uh, such uh, historical subjects for pantomime. But uh, the style of Libanius styles of Demetrius and Seleucus, the, the text, uh, your text, uh, is really, it is really an, the style or the way um, of an ekphrasis, ekphrasis, uh, as you know, is a description, but uh, a description um, of a building or of a um, um, sculpture, but also description of um, of a gesture. The the principle of ekphrasis is to put on the eye uh, of the uh, auditors uh, the, uh, the, the your subject. So he, it is like um, uh, he, Libanius. Uh, Tells, tells the story of Demetrius and Seleucus uh, as um, he would made an ekphrasis of a pantomime. And um, this is the style uh, of Libanius in uh, this passage is very now of Julianus style, of Julianus way of um, tell the story in his version, in Julianus versions of the love story between Antiochus first and Stratoniki. Uh, um, Julianus tells, uh, the emperor Julianus uh, tells his story in his miso misopogon. And, and really it is like he uh, he is describing uh, a play uh, or a dance uh, in the theater with uh, the, the, the gesture uh, of Antiochus and of uh, the, um, the doctor. With, uh, it's, it's very, very funny. Alors, so uh, maybe this, past, um, this passage, this text of Libanius, is not a direct allusion to a pantomime relating the story of the Okeiotes between Antigonids and Seleucid. A pantomime which non exists, I think, but which will be a good illustration of your PhD thesis. But uh, I think that for Libanius, it is simply a really good story so, to illustrate himself as a good sophist. And it is, uh, I, I think, um, a good reason uh, for um, insert his story in his speech. It's not necessary to imagine that uh, the, the reason is to help Demetrius, for his friend Demetrius. But, but really, it's a... Voilà, it's a it's a good it's a good story for him. <laughs> well, so thank you very much again for your uh, for your work. It was very interesting for me. Okay, thank, thank you, you very friend. much, country. Okay, uh, Angus, would you like to unmute and respond? Um, yeah, 
Um, I was just furiously taking notes, not not furiously as in angrily, but <laughs> very busily <laughs> writing down notes as I was going. Um, thank you, thank you for your response, Catherine. Um, these these notes will be um, indispensable in in going back over um, this paper and and also refining it. Um, of course, the, the major, um, I suppose, constructive criticism that you gave was that um, my 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 connection um, to Demetrius uh, to as he was he, as he is named in the the prosopography of uh, the late Roman Empire um, is far fetched. Um, I yeah I agree. Um, <laughs> when I when I wrote it when I wrote it um, it was something that I was thinking I had to sort of think out outside of the box about it because I I, I hadn't really considered that the pantomime and the importance of that to um to Libanius as a sophist. So I, I do appreciate you mentioning that. Um so yeah, I I, I mean I am I am aware that it's far fetched. Um but it was sort of like something I was like, well <laughs> I suppose it's a it's it's something that 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 could have been considered. Um and you're right, there are many, many Demetriuses, um including Funnily enough, a Demetrius, a, a Seleucid king named Demetrius Sota, um, not to be confused with the tradition that I'm talking about here. Um, it's something that dawned on me last night when I was like, ah, oh, I forgot there was a king called Demetrius Sota. <laughs> um, but yes, um, I, 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 I think, yeah, I think you're right, uh, and I think it's something that that I will have to go over and um, rethink. Um, but. Perhaps it's it's less so to do with if if there is any any kernel of an argument there, then perhaps it's it's less so to do with the fact that Demetrius is is irreputed, uh, as opposed to perhaps um, enhancing just generally enhancing the the reputation of uh, his friend Demetrius um, by showing Demetrius Polyakertes' uh, involvement in in Antioch's. Uh, creation. So perhaps that's probably a more um, suitable argument than than rather arguing that um, that he was doing it because Demetrius was in ill repute, as you say. Um, as to um, the Malalis and Pausanias connection, I'll I'll go through that quickly because I, I think you've stated everything that needs to be said said there. Um, I. My my knowledge of of Malalis has has grown since I've written this chapter because I've also had to consider him um, for the conference of Rossus as well, um, especially because he is the source that says that um, the the first wife of Seleucus uh, Palmer dies before the marriage of um, of the marriage of of um, Seleucus and Stratonici, which we now know not to be the case um, because there is actually um, a, a, an inscription from Uruk that has come out um, date, dated to around 283, which mentions the Queen of Palmer um, funding or, or benefacting a, a, a temple in, in Uruk, um, which is quite, quite fascinating. That only just came out in 2023. Um, but... So, so I had to consider Malalis more in that chapter, um, and and I of course know that he is also using the source um, Domninus, uh, I believe. Um, so, uh, his his use of Pausanias of Antioch is is probably more indirect uh, than has than was initially um, initially assumed. Um, I'm just trying to read through my notes here. Um, I'll, I'll consider the the comparison with theatre as well. I didn't look at any um, Ariadne and and Theseus uh, Theseus dramas, um, but I think there is some merit in doing that. So I will um, surely go through and and um, look at everything there is on on Ariadne and, and Theseus to see if there can be some sort of um, connection to an existing source um, that 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 we have. Um, wouldn't that be lovely? Um, but um, yes, and and also the gesture as well. Um, I think that's quite a good point that um, this silent communication is associated with the Seleucids, but also a repeating motif throughout um, 
literature, uh, imperial literature, it's Roman imperial literature as well. Um, so I think that's everything I have to say. Um, hopefully that all, all made sense uh, in my 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 ramblings there. Um, Angus, just in terms of that that point about um, the other Demetrius, let's say I had a friend named Angus, right? And I was yeah. writing about Angus, uh, you know, there's no way it's not on my mind a little bit. So, you know, yeah. I'm wondering if, if if you couldn't find something in the middle that is even just in a footnote or something saying, you know, mm. one wonders whether there was some connection or something like that. You know, mm. maybe there's, you know, so taking Katrine's, you know, um, uh, strictures, um, you know, seriously, but but I, I, I think that maybe, you know, you're right anyway, you know, yeah. that, that that because, you know, you, you know what I mean? Like, if I have a friend named Angus and I'm seeing that name, somehow it's playing in my head in some way. Um, Altai has a question. Well, I, I would actually like to echo uh, uh, what you've just said, Ben. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Angus and Catherine, for uh, your presentation and your um, feedback. Um, well, one aspect that, that really um, shows the excellence of your research, Angus, is how carefully you consider various arguments or pieces of evidence uh, very open-mindedly going into uh, various directions. The funny thing is when Catherine suggested that you drop the reference to Demetrius the friend, she actually strengthened your main argument namely that Libanius had a serious source uh, and did not mm -hmm. just make it up. My yes, yes, actually, yes, yes. Yeah, but my spontaneous thought went into the opposite direction. We, we had an exchange about uh, this previously, but I still try to understand how is it possible that Libanius digs out a source that had been obliterated for uh, more than six centuries especially after Plutarch should have had an interest in mentioning such a nicety of Demetrius. Or you could now say, well, but then he would have duplicated um, the Mithridatic uh, scene, and so he just chose the one. I grant you that, but there are opportunities in our um, tradition that really make me wonder. How is it possible that such a noteworthy early connection had remained unmentioned? And then, although I agree to uh, Catherine that there were many Dimitrioi uh, around, it is the specific addressee of the speech, uh, the only source that ever makes that connection with Dimitrios. Um, I, I found that actually... Uh, very generous of yours to include that into your discussion, although it did undermine your main thesis. And 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 I, I so I'm still attracted by the idea that this is um, or this may be a fabrication, kind of a flattery or an homage to a friend. And I was wondering, and that question goes to um, Catherine, who is. Uh, uh, so knowledgeable ab about Libanius, would he make such things up? Uh, is there would there be parallels for Libanius to be so flexible and creative right. with historical slash mythical tradition? So that is the question I would ask to decide it uh, to to decide the question uh, whether we should pursue the thought of admitting a fabrication or no, Libanius is actually too, too diligent uh, and uh, too scrupulous to make these things up. So mm -hmm. the, the question goes to you, Catherine, uh, okay. mainly. Okay, if, if I can um, answer. Um, no, uh, Li Libanius is not scrupulous. So he, he, ca um, he can um, invent imagine, but uh, in fact, uh, his friend Demetrius is not the address of the speech. The addresses of the speech, the auditors, are all the people who are in the um, Olympic uh, celebration, and there are all the Antiochians, virtually all the Antiochians, and all the people who came to see the Olympics. Like for uh, for us in Paris, it was a 
Do you understand what the other thing is? I understand. The population. So, uh, and, I understand. Alors, it is true that uh, he sent uh, he, he, his speech, the uh, Antiochicos, to his friend Demetrios, but um, in 300, the letter is that, the letter, um, his, uh, he sent the speech with a letter, and so we have the letter, and the letter is that that is dated from uh, 358 or 59, so two years or two years after. So for his friend, it was not so important to read this uh, because and uh, his friend was uh, was governor of the, um, of a province province, but uh, also a, a sophist, and uh, Libanius and Demetrius uh, exchange uh, often um, uh, their speeches, their productions. So and uh, in this letter, he explains to Demetrius that he sent to him. Four speeches. One speeches for Strategios, the, uh, the prefect, uh, prefect uh, 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 um, uh, a state um, government uh, officer, and two other speech and the Antiochicos. So it is not so. I think that uh, it is not so important of the for Demet for Libanius and Demetrius, but the Antiochicos is not so important uh, for the relationship between um, Libanius and Demetrius. So I, I think so. Yeah. Thank you for this clarification. But Angus, yeah, this is basically for you to consider and uh, to oh. to follow up on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we have other questions or comments? Stanley, is that you? Yeah. Um, Angus, this is very interesting. Very interesting, Hello. Uh, the only thing that concerns me is your dating. I, I agree with the, that this story of Seleucus and Demetrius probably takes precedence over the Mithridatic version. But relation, the date 390, 300 to 297 for its origins is to me problematic because relations between Ptolemy and Seleucus in this period, right after Ipsus, uh, after Ptolemy had stolen from Seleucus' point of view, Sealy Syria, is difficult. Uh, and in fact, in this same period, um, the marriage between Seleucus and Stratonice is paralleled by the marriage of between alliance between Ptolemy the first and Lysimachus, <laughs> who uh, so that that bothers me. Uh, I, you might consider an alternate at least an alternate date. The interesting thing about this story is that it actually explains an obligation Seleucus might feel toward Demetrius. And there is a period when that is significant, and that's the middle 280s, which you mentioned. Um, Lysimachus wanted Demetrius dead. <laughs> And whatever one may say about Seleucus' treatment of Demetrius, um, he did not he did not agree. Um, and this story does provide an, an explanation for an obligation, <laughs> uh, namely that Demetrius had saved Seleucus' life at one point. So it's at least you might think consider in your in your uh, as a possible alternative. Hmm. Otherwise, as I say, your main point, one of your main points, eliminating the Mithridatic story, strikes me as entirely good news. It simplifies matters no end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I yeah, I I agree with the. I mean, we're still dating 
the this this post Ross's period or, or post Ipsus period in general, um, it's still still going back and forth about the dates for this period. Um, I suppose the thing that is most important about that that time period, Stanley, is that um, we do have this mention of Seleucus um, mediating the marriage um, between uh, Ptolemaeus and uh, who's the daughter of Ptolemy. So obviously Ptolemy was involved in that and also um, Demetrius, um, which which we don't have a secure date for, but we, we obviously know that the planning began during this period, um, but the marriage was not completed until uh, 287, I believe. Um, so it, it is odd that that after this this conflict with um, over Coeli Syria in the in the immediate aftermath of Ipsus, um, that suddenly a couple of years later Seleucus um, and um, Seleucus and, and and Ptolemy are now um, cooperating together again. Um, but I think I think if I could use a very simplistic response. Um, I think, and probably very hypothetical as well, and something which I, I probably argue much better in my chapter that 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 um, addresses this period is that um, Seleucus was quite a prudent, um, quite a prudent leader, and that he um, would not prize his um, or prize his pride over over prudence, essentially. So. Um, he 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 knew when he had to let something go and when he had to um uh, create a, a circumstances that that benefited him um, but also benefited now his ally demetrius um so there, there is more to that um which i which i could argue about um but i don't have the the resources available to me at the moment um because i don't have my paper open but um uh, thank you for your your agreement with my with my comments on on the mithridatic um flight myth that's that's good to know at least i i i i mean obviously i agree that that um there is a um that that the mithridatic flight myth is, seems like a a copy of another um uh myth especially if this seleucid myth existed before um but yes um as always open open to um other suggestions I'll tell you have another hand. Um, yeah, I just wanted uh, to um, to to back you up a little bit, Angus, uh, in the triangle relation, um, and uh, because I am part of the uh, or partly um, culpable for um, also setting you on the track um, to to confirm uh, the belief that there was actually not so much um, hostility between Seleucus and Ptolemy um, soon after Ipsos. The, the report um, that we find um, well in in the literary tradition is uh, or the reports the two the two fragments um, in uh, um, in Diodorus and in uh, in in Plutarch they do not really fit together very well um, and uh, they as uh, you have rightly pointed out Angus Seleucus was in a position to negotiate um, at least a betrothal between the house of Demetrius and the house of Ptolemy. And uh, we see that the result of Rosos or the context of Rosos saw um, negotiations and in fact, uh, a pacification of the whole situation involving also um, Cassandros and Lysimachos. And uh, I think the whole process was driven by the desire for consolidation because everyone saw that Demetrius was not giving up. He was actually making progress in the Aegean at the cost of Lysimachos, who was quite isolated. Um, and uh, he was certainly not uh, happy to um, to give up on all of uh, Cilicia either. So it's an open question when he started retaking Cilicia. Seleucus, uh, on the other hand, had been hoping some further gains, whether it's Coile Syria or Phoenicia or more parts of um, Cilicia, all of these are mentions, uh, mentioned as on the negotiating table. Um, but what was then negotiated was that he got a daughter of Demetrius to marry, and that peace was agreed on so that um, Seleucus could consolidate his 
his possessions and concentrate on city building, which is explicitly mentioned um, in the sources as his main concern. So I would actually therefore take out of the equation the assumption that there was hostility with Ptolemy. Um, and that, that is the basis of Angus's, um, uh, one of the, 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 the bases of um, uh, Angus's arguments. What I do caution about, however, is the assumption that there must have been a triangle relation as the background for the for the myth itself. There is the alternative possible, I mean, the myth that both Ptolemy and Demetrius saved, um, saved um, Seleucus. It would be sufficient to have one tradition highlighting the agency of Demetrius Soter and uh, another tradition highlighting the agency of um, Ptolemy Soter. And uh, at some point, and you 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 want to argue Angus at a very early point. <laughs> um, these two traditions were brought together, and if you are right, and it was really so early, then the likelihood is good that it was at a time where the, the three were friends um, and at peace with each other. Um, I am not so convinced here yet. Firstly, because of the gap in our tradition, um, and we only can seize. Um, this in in Libanius and and second, I have not yet understood why Jerome or Hieronymus of uh, of Cardia should not be a good source for um, the Mithridatic flight legend in our literary tradition. So um, I, I have not finalized my view on this, and I I, I look forward to to your final argument but here i think you 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 have to enhance your your argument to convince me that it was not hieronymus and with that we we would be uh, a few years later but basically we would be in the next generation when uh, obviously the house of uh, seleucus and the house of the ptolemies was in uh, they they were hostile to each other so um yeah, so here I, I I continue having some some open open questions, and uh, I look forward to seeing how your final version in your thesis will well will address these these problems. Uh, ben, can I just respond to Altai quickly? Is that okay? Sure, sure. It's it's your session. <laughs> cool. Um, <laughs> of course. Great. We'll start off with Hieronymus. Um, because because this is the thing, right? Um, I mean, I don't really allude to who wrote the Seleucid tradition, um, probably because I didn't want to make it too complicated for my thesis. I mean, if I was going to publish this, then I would expand on that. Um, but I think Hieronymus remains a, a, a possibility for the Seleucid tradition, um, which I believe was was originally argued. Uh, a long time ago. I can't quite remember about who it was, uh, but uh, that's going to annoy me that I've forgotten that. <laughs> um, but as for the Mithridatic tradition, the, the evidence that I give in, in, in my paper is that um, our fragments uh, that are that are um, preserved for us in, in, in Pseudo-Lucian and in Appian don't mention Demetrius. Which is, of course, the, the the defining feature of the Mithridatic flight myth, isn't it? Is that that Demetrius is the savior of, um, or at least in Plutarch, um, is that that Demetrius is the savior of um, of Mithridates? And so, considering the fact that we have these two um, certain, I suppose, or, or, or near certain. Um, fragment. I mean, nothing's ever certain, but the, these fragments that have been identified, where the authors have said this is what Hieronymus records, uh, and no mention of Demetrius, um, that in my mind implies that that Hieronymus did not include Demetrius in his um, in his Mithridatic flight myth. If he did record a Mithridatic flight myth, um, which it seems likely. Um, but as I said, it's more likely that it's in 302 as opposed to um, this earlier 314 um, 
flight myth that, that Plutarch um, supposedly records. You also mentioned that, that these, in your mind, there's these two traditions, right? That there's the Ptolemy Soda tradition and the the Demetrius Soda tradition of, of the Seleucid um, of the Seleucid myth. So we're now referring to the Seleucid myth. Um, but then would this not mean that Libanius had to combine these two as well? Or would we presume that that another source somewhere along the way combined these two to create um, <laughs> to create a, a, a combined um, uh, Ceteres um, tradition uh, with both Ptolemy and, and Demetrius in it, which of course complicates things um, a little bit, doesn't it? Um, so... Uh, I mean that that's just a a, a small I suppose a, a preliminary response to those concerns that you have Altai. Um, I can't quite think if I have anything else to add, but I think think that's basically my my thoughts currently on on that response as best as I can conjure up at at two thirty in the morning. I I know it's two thirty in the morning, but just one more question. Okay, uh, <laughs> um, going back to the very basic part about why Seleucus had to flee um and you know something that's always been attributed and, I th and if i heard you right you were saying you don't really buy the financial thing that that antigonus was uh, uh was was using that as uh as an excuse but do you take it that Silicus was just as you were saying he was a very formidable person right mm -hmm. very resourceful i mean he really rose all the way up um and that he was popular that, you know, because when he comes back with not a whole lot of guys, right, and he comes back and then there's the whole civil war and all that stuff that goes on in Babylon and everything like that. But I think that maybe, you know, you come in and he and he this guy's just really popular and it's really getting to you and you got to get rid of this guy because he's going to just, boy, you know, look, look at what he's doing and he's in my turf and I got to get rid of this guy. Would you agree with that? I would. Um, I, in fact, I think that's that's precisely the reason. And I think I um, actually there's a uh, I think I misspoke a line in my actual paper, um, which refers to the fact that Seleucus is renowned for his governance of Babylonia, that he is uh, liked and, and well received. Of course, we're, we're so fortunate to have um, the Babylonian Chronicles for this right. um, sort of information. Um, and I think the only negative thing if i remember correctly is that uh he he at one stage taxed quite a lot of silver uh, from the treasury uh but you got to do what you got to do um <laughs> when you're in charge of uh, such a huge satrapy um and, and you're right he may, that he may have needed to do that right yeah yeah exactly um and and when he returns as you say um with what a thousand ptolemaic men suddenly he's conquering Suzanne and, and and media with um uh, supposedly local troops um that they've gone to um support gone on to support Seleucus. So I would agree with that. I think that that's what the classical sources and the Babylonian sources reveal at least is that that Seleucus was formidable and that he was um charismatic, I suppose you could call him to the extent that uh, he attracted people to his cause. Um, and this might have been further amplified by the fact that Antigonus wasn't a very likable person. Right. Um, so, um, yes, I, I, I do agree with you there, Ben. OK. All right. On that happy note, we're going to we're going to stop, I think. But we thank very much. We thank Angus. We thank Katrine for their wonderful oh, presentation today. And our next our next lecture, I'll tie. Did you already put it in the chat box? Is yes. That October... It will be on October 16. By uh, Dr. Ian Stern from Haifa University, um, and the title is "The Rise and Fall of Hellenistic Period Marisha," and feedback will be presented by Dr. Stuart Miller from the University of Connecticut. So hopefully, we'll see as many of you and others um, as possible. Right. Thank you very much again to um, especially Angus and Kathleen. Okay. Thank you for the invitation.